live from Kane Hall on the campus of the University of Washington in Seattle. The Evans School of Public Affairs presents a new ball game, Challenges of Intercollegiate Athletics in the University. This event is co-sponsored by the University of Washington Alumni Association. Now please welcome the Dean of the Evans School, Sandra O. Archibald. Welcome everyone to the Evans School's A New Ball Game, Challenges of Intercollegiate Athletics in the University, part of our ongoing Faculty Roundtable series. I would like to extend a special welcome to some of our very important guests here this evening. The Honorable Daniel J. Evans, former three-term governor of the state of Washington and U.S. Senator and namesake of the Evans School, and Nancy Bell Evans, namesake of the Nancy Bell Evans Center on Nonprofits and Philanthropy. Jeremy Jake, UW Regent. Chris Jordan, UW Student Regent, UW Law School student and former graduate of the Evans School. Sally Clark, president of the Seattle City Council, also an Evans School alumnus. There's a pattern here. <laughs> Evans School Advisory Board Chair, John Hurster and his wife, Carol. And Paul Rucker, Associate Vice President of Alumni Relations and the Executive Director of the UW Alumni Association, co-sponsor of tonight's event and also an Evans School alum. <laughs> I'd like to sincerely thank Paul and the UW Alumni Association for co-sponsoring and supporting tonight's event. They have been an invaluable partner and a great help to us. I'd like to give a special welcome this evening to those of you watching us li live online right now through UW TV webcast. And it's wonderful to see all of you here this evening. And I'm looking forward to discussing this timely critical policy issue. A quick bit of housekeeping. We are also live tweeting this evening. So for all of you tweeters out there, please feel free to follow along at the hashtag NewBallGameUW. These conversations are a unique way for the Evans School to share how our faculty, student, and alumni research, learning, and service provide connected, integrative solutions to complex public policy and management issues. This is the fifth roundtable in our series. We previously touched on topics such as poverty alleviation, education policy, and philanthropy. It's all part of our initiative to share our evidence-based policy research and practice more broadly within the Evans community and the University of Washington. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's panel, and please hold your applause until I get through to the end. We have J. Patrick Doble, the John and Marguerite Walker Corbelly Professor in Public Service at the Evans School, a scholar who lives and breathes the ethics of intercollegiate athletics in both his research and on his blog, pointofthegame.net, for those of you interested. Ed Taylor, Professor of Education, Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Academic Affairs. Ed's responsible for many of the policies keeping our athletes successfully engaged academically. Lorenzo Romar, head coach of the UW men's basketball team, the Pac-12's longest tenured coach with 11 years at the helm of the Husky basketball team. Heather Tarr, head coach of the UW women's softball team. Heather was named Pac-10 coach, Pac coach of the year in 2010. And finally, we're delighted to welcome back to the campus Mark Emmert president of the NC2A, former president of the University of Washington, UW alum, and one of the best faculty members I ever had at the Evans School. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. <laughs> it's my particular pleasure this evening to introduce the president of the University of Washington, Michael K. Young. President Rung Young has a distinguished record as an academic leader with broad experience in national public service and international diplomacy. He served as president and distinguished professor of law at the University of Utah prior to his appointment at the University of Washington. Un University presidents, as I'm both sure that President Young and Dr. Emmert will tell you this evening, 
have to pay close attention to intercollegiate athletics. Athletics are a strong community building activity for the university, a revenue generator, and most importantly, athletics shapes the lives of our young students. Athletics also bring challenges, academic, ethical, and monetary. I know President Young has successfully managed these types of challenges at both Utah and at the University of Washington. We are delighted to have him join us this evening for the Evans School Faculty Roundtable. Ladies and gentlemen, University of Washington President Michael K. Young. Mark, welcome back. All is forgiven. <laughs> We're in the middle of the legislative session, and if you want to take over that office in Gerberding, <laughs> I want to invite you to do that. Thank you all for joining us for this, what will prove to be, I am certain, a very interesting discussion of something that is deeply important, not only to our university, to our students, uh, but indeed, one can't open the newspaper or turn on the television without understanding its importance, uh, indeed, to the nation. So this is a great topic to talk about tonight, and I want to particularly commend the Evans School. Uh, these roundtables, I think, are uh, extraordinary opportunities to bring in people whose uh, expertise and experience and insight is absolutely invaluable in trying to unravel the complexities, uh, to understand the challenges and the opportunities, and help us see a way forward. What's particularly exciting about these is it is a wonderful example of the way in which the Evans School moves not only, in ter not only to help people um, better engage the issues uh, and teach as they do so uh, uh, terrifically at the school, but also to research, to understand, to unravel these issues in ways that help us see to the bottom of them in important ways. And this is a great example of that. So I want to commend the Evans School and uh, express deep thanks to all of the panelists. Uh, on a day like this, the fact that you would come and share your insight to us is particularly uh, appreciated. The only thing I want to do uh, in my uh, brief welcoming remarks is to, is, to, is to play the role of an academic for a moment, if I may, and edit. Uh, and what I want to do is edit the title, uh, A New Ball Game. Um, I, I'm a bit of a, of a, of a uh, historian. Uh, an amateur historian, and as one looks in the intercollegiate athletics, it is a little unclear that there's anything new under the sun. Uh, intercollegiate athletics really uh, started and got their impetus uh, in the late, uh, in the early 1820s, mid 1820s, was part of the German gymnasium movement, uh, and then moved to more formal kinds of, uh, of activities as between schools. Uh, and they were designed, uh, as the various participants suggested, to create school spirit, uh, uh, to um, create physical development, competition, uh, alumni allegiance, uh, and bonding opportunities for the students who are on the campus as well. Um, but in some cases, they did have a tendency to overlook uh, the academic uh, mission, though they did contribute to it in ways. Uh, in 1870, Massachusetts Agricultural College beat Harvard. Uh, in an athletic competition and said about itself at that point that it gave the agricultural college standing as a real college. Uh, and the consequence of that was the legislature gave it more money. Um, <laughs> but there were challenges. Uh, early players in football actually uh, were largely uh, paid uh, and, and, and often um, paid, played with greater frequency for more teams than one might consider appropriate in this day and age. Uh, in, uh, early on in uh, the late uh, 1870s, Oregon played uh, three collegiate teams in a row and observed that the players on each of the three teams were exactly the same players each week. Um, and the Dartmouth father, having observed all this, actually pulled his son out of Dartmouth in protest on the emphasis on intercollegiate athletics. But perhaps it was said best in 1892, um, to give you the sense this isn't quite as new as the Evans School would have you believe. This is President Elliott of Harvard, who wrote in his annual uh, report, quote, there's something especially or exquisitely, there's something exquisitely inappropriate in the extravagant expenditure on athletic sports at such institutions as Harvard and Yale. 
institutions which have been painfully built up by the self-denial, frugality, and public spirit of generations that certainly did not lack physical and moral courage, yet always put the things of spirit above the things of sense. At these universities, there must be constant economy and an inadequacy in expenditure for intellectual objects. How repulsive, then, must be football uh, and pernicious expenditures on sports. Uh, so the point is, this is not exactly a new debate that we're having tonight about the role of intercollegiate athletics, how one controls it, the role that it plays in a university life and in the lives of uh, these institutions that have as their objective uh, education and research uh, as well as community service. Uh, we have a terrific group tonight that I think uh, understands this better uh, than uh, any other group of people I think I know who exemplify it with the remarkable honor and integrity uh, and have lived it uh, in important ways. So I think we're in for a real treat tonight. And thank you all for being with us and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, President Young. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. And I want to give special thanks to the members of our panel because all of them have taken time out from really <laughs> extremely busy and complicated lives to make it. I have special gratitude to President Emmert for taking the time out of his family's life and out of his work life to come to this kind of panel. I want to thank both the coaches because this is high recruiting season for Coach Romar. And being here is taking time away from flying in some airplane to an obscure place <laughs> to watch a player. And Coach Tarr is actually in the middle of the softball season and is leaving this panel to get on a plane to go on a recruiting trip. So I really appreciate all of you for spending the time. And Ed, thanks for coming. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself on that one. Um, <laughs> my name is Pat Doble. I teach at the Evans School of Public Affairs, and I served as a faculty athletic representative at the University of Washington for seven years. And I'm willing to bet that no one in this audience, or maybe no more than five people, know what the faculty athletic rep or the FAR is. So I want to briefly talk about that. The, the FAR is a faculty member who's appointed directly by the president to act as, and I like Mark's words on this, the conscience for the program. Uh, the the athletic, faculty athletic rep representative is supposed to be working to oversee both the academic and the compliance integrity of programs, and that was a job I was able to serve for a little over seven years. I owe a lot to my predecessor, Professor Rob Aronson of the School of Law. And I'm extremely grateful to my successor, who's here in the audience, Professor Pete Dukes of the Business School, who's doing a superb job. Tonight's panel will uh, have this, the following structure. I think what we wanted to really do was focus on an issue that, amid all of the hubbub and all of the media coverage, is oftentimes ignored, and that is, how do we as institutions, the NCAA, the university, the athletic department, and coaches on teams guarantee that the student athletes actually get an education, that they are educated as is appropriate in a university setting and that we are not exploiting them for the university's benefit and we are leaving them with something of value beyond the time playing for the team. Uh, the way we're going to structure this is that Professor Emmert, or excuse me, President Emmert and Professor Emmert will be talking for 10 minutes, and he will be addressing two issues. One, the governance structure of the NCAA, because I don't think we can understand what happens in this world unless we understand how complicated and actually quite weird the NCAA governance structure is. And then he's going to look at the major academic reform movement over the last three years that I think have made a huge difference in impacting the question of whether college athletes are actually getting a college education in addition to being able to play for their universities. What we will then do is each panelist will speak from uh, uh, sitting up, up front about a specific topic and when I introduce them I'll mention that topic. 
then we will go into a kind of discussion based around a series of questions uh, for about 15 or 20 minutes. Now, you all have received a slip of paper when you came in, and I want you to feel free to write down any questions you might have at any point. And I will be asking you to send those questions to the aisle probably around 6.50 or 7 so that we can gather them up and then try to get questions from that. So the last 15 minutes we'll try to address what questions we can from the audience. I also want to emphasize what uh, Dean <coughs> Archibald had talked about was that those of you who are following us on the web can send in those questions at new ball game UW, uh, if, you ha if you so choose. Before we start, I want to give a little context to what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I must admit, President Young actually stole or uh, usurped the first part of my talk because I wanted to talk about exactly the point he made. College athletics and the, the wedding of intercollegiate athletics and university education is, is unique in the United States. And it grew both by, by design and by accident. And I think what we've inherited is a result of both. As he pointed out, the American higher education was founded by classicists. And the classicists deeply believed in educating the character and the spirit and the virtues of their students as well as providing intellectual and uh, technical education. As a result, those professors and administrators believed that the physical challenge of sport could provide a kind of education around character and community and identity that was not always provided in the classroom itself. In addition, they believed from their classical upbringing that sport itself exemplified a kind of excellence that deserved respect and honor within the university. In the 1840s, um, what we call college sports have begun to develop largely sponsored by students. Students managed it, students recruited it, students hired the players who weren't necessarily students to play, as he pointed out. And what happened very quickly was it began really with crew and then migrated to baseball and swimming, basketball, a number of other sports, but above all, football football and grew in increasing importance through the latter half of the 18th century. And the teams and athletics quickly outgrew anyone's expectations. Literally, the universities lost control of them very, very quickly. Rabid students, rabid alums, rabid community interests made sports events lively and important for school spirit, identity, and most important, school contributions. In addition, cities and schools got in the business sponsoring events to make profits. And in the case of the first Rose Bowl, or the first bowl event, which occurred in 1902, a nonprofit organization was formed to sponsor the Rose Bowl in Pasadena in order to increase tourism and tourist visibility and investment in Pasadena. So this wedding, this connection of sport school and commerce occurred at a very early level. And I think as President Young pointed out so eloquently, along as these stakes rose, very quickly you found the scandals and the cheating where for a fairly large number of times members of the team of the school were not necessarily students at the school. Mark likes to point out a fact that when the Big Ten was first formed, was one of the first conferences, one of their first rules was you could only have two professionals on your athletic team. <laughs> um, as these scandals occurred, and one a fairly common thing is that as schools tried to gain more control over them, alums stepped forward and would simply pay students to go to the schools that they went to, to go to their alma maters, and then they would pay the tuition of the students who went to their alma maters in order to gain competitive advantage. The NCAA itself was born out of an attempt to regulate these things, but most importantly, it's not just about regulating competition, but it's about student safety, it's about student welfare. And in the year 1905, 18 football players died playing college football. In addition, 148 were severely injured. Of those, 90 of them were maimed for life. As a result of this, President Roosevelt 
convene the presidents of these, com of these universities threatening to abolish football unless they reform football. And that and the rest, they say, is history. Where are we today? Today, we're dealing with a massive complex with almost 500,000 students participating in intercollegiate athletics at, in over 1,100 schools at three very different types of schools, overseeing 33 competitive sports and 89 championships. It involves an immense amount of management and challenge across the domains. It challenges the presidents, it challenges the athletic directors, it challenges the coaches. I think in addition, we have to realize, and this is an extremely important thing to remember, of these thousands of teams, of these 1,100 schools, only 20 to 25 claim that their revenue exceeds their expenditures. That means all the other universities are losing money. Intercollegiate athletics, like higher education, is a money-losing proposition. It, the, the revenue does not cover the cost. So that means in the vast majority of schools, even with fundraising, student fees, and ticket sales, there has to be direct subsidy of intercollegiate athletics by the universities, except for 20 to 25 universities. Now, as this has happened, it's happening at the same time, public education is being underfunded and defunded. So the quest is upon how do you find the revenues to sustain this enterprise? And the answer, at least for the elite programs, has come in the form of, I want you to listen to this, $25.5 billion in counting over the next 15 years. These are the media transfer rights that television and radio and digital media are paying to conferences and universities for the right to televise football, to a lesser extent basketball, and all of the other sports. 25.5 billion in counting. That is the only way that universities have found as a way to finance this inherently money losing proposition. At the same time as visibility has gone up, intercollegiate athletic football has become the second most popular sport in America. It has passed baseball. It's, it's second only to NFL football. As a result of this, there's also an all-time high levels of participation in all the NCAA sports, and 95% of all media mentions of higher education involve sports activities. So with this media visibility and this need for money, the desirability or the imperative to win has become overwhelmingly <laughs> important. This has meant that there's been an immense value placed on hiring good coaches and successful coaches. This has led to an incredible explosion in the coaching salaries. The highest paid public official in every state in the United States is the football coach. The second highest paid public official is the basketball coach. And this is the norm. On the other hand, the pressure to win puts <coughs> immense pressure on these coaches. 15 to 20 percent of all college coaches in Division I are fired at the end of every year and of those, 50% have winning <laughs> records. <laughs> Just in passing. <laughs> I think it's important to remember this because we seldom understand the pressure put on coaches. All we look at are those salaries. We don't look at how brutally universities treat them. Don't expect loyalty from universities when it comes to coaches, and coaches know that. And that's one of the reasons why the mess exists. This is not just the coaches. This is the activity and the decision making in the universities themselves for whom 50% of the coaches they fire are actually have winning records. Now what this has meant with the visibility, the money, the intense pressure to win is that we have an ongoing steady array of scandals and illegality and cheating that we discover and are fed to us by the media. In the last two years, I'll just tick off a couple. Uh, there have been several major cases of boosters and agents giving illegal benefits to uh, athletes. There have been several cases of coaches lying and covering up the infractions when they occurred. There have been two major scandals involving cheating, involving changing grades. 
are having tutors writing papers for the student and athletes. And in one extraordinary event, we discovered that one of the most respected programs in college football and in college athletics was sheltering a pedophile coach while senior coaches and senior administrators looked the other way when it was brought to their attention. Finally, scandals have rocked the NCAA itself in terms of flawed uh, investigations, such as what occurred in the Miami. And we at the University of Washington know this well because we lost a major lawsuit with Coach Rick Neuheisel when the NCAA did not follow its own procedures and we had to settle out of court because of that. So what we've got is an environment where the pressures that we have created are putting immense stress upon the integrity of the system itself. And behind that lies the simple fact that we're dealing with young men and women who are students. And that is the focus of this panel, and I think that should always be the focus of our policy making. And that is asking the question, how do we ensure at the NCAA, at the university, at the conference, at the team level, that they are getting the education we promised them. President Emmert will begin by addressing the issues of the NCAA governance structure and the reform movement. Mark Emmert was, was appointed the fifth president of the NCAA in 2010, and he's the second university president to uh, hold that position. It was an immense move in the NCAA to bring presidents in charge as opposed to athletic directors or athletic officials. And he has served both as chancellor at LSU, as chancellor and provost at the University of Connecticut. He served as provost at Montana State and as associate vice chancellor for academic affairs at Colorado. He's written extensively on issues of public and private sector. I used to teach one of his articles in my classes. And he has served on innumerable committees. Uh, he is a lifetime member of the Council of Foreign Affairs and a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. And as a personal note, when I was appointed FAR, right before Mark was hired, the University of Washington was going on probation for the second time in 10 years. We had just fired 13 coaches. We had just lost our entire compliance department. We had lost our athletic director. We had to disassociate from a doctor who was writing illegal prescriptions and illegal prescription drugs for student athletes. And we had to fire our head trainer for falsifying records in order to get um, uh, academic, in order to get red shirts, our physical red shirts for some football players. Mark inherited this, and I can say that he was relentless in his active support to address these issues, including drawing a series of lines that protected the academic admissions process, of supporting and financing a, a refurbished oversight process that, that enabled far more direct academic oversight, faculty oversight, and a higher, much higher level of professionalism in the department, and for that I both was honored to serve with him and grateful for his support. It's my honor to present the NCAA President, Mark Emmert. Well, thank you very much. First of all, it's great to be back in Kane Hall. I have memories of this uh, classroom from when I was a student here. This was a brand new building. It's about to be blown up and replaced, I'm sure. It's that old. Uh, but it, but it, it, it's marvelous to be back, and President Young, thank you for, uh, for your great hospitality. It's always wonderful to come back to one's alma mater. And, and I know, coaches, that, that he has loyalty that goes deep, no matter what Pat says, and you guys are good through the end of the season. I mean, it's, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. You know. Well, first of all, I, th this is, th these are great introductory comments, and I'm, I was really pleased that President Young uh, brought the history of the NCAA into it, because I think one of the first points I'd want to make is the one that, that Mike just made, and that is that while, while there's many things that are new in college sports, and the, the resources and the energy and the, the media attention that's drawn to sport is certainly different, most of the problems are indeed uh, are indeed quite old. They just are different in magnitude, but not particularly different in, in kind. If you go back and read 
the editorials that were being written and the news commentary that was being provided about a century ago when the NCA was started, it reads almost identical to today. It's quite fascinating to, to go back and look at that, at that history. So if you go back to the beginnings of the NCA, you start to, and, and you recognize that, you start to understand the fundamental difference about what the NCA is relative to, frankly, what most people think. When you, when you think of my job, for example, or the, the NCA as a sports entity rather than an educational entity, you immediately start looking at comparisons with the NBA or the NFL or, and the commissioners who run those things, and, and that, that is completely and utterly wrong. The, the model is one that's quite extraordinary in that 1904, 1905, they start conversations and then launch this thing the following year about how to have universities come together and self-regulate through a democratic representative model of decision-making all of these activities. The, the uh, notion that the president of the NCAA has the authority of a commissioner of the NBA exists only in my dreams. Uh, you should never think about me or, or whoever sits in this chair as having a, a commissioner-like responsibility. Think much more about Ban Ki-moon and the Secretary General of the UN. It's a much more apt comparison because all of the decision making from the very beginning on, all of the decision making, all the rules, all the structure, all the authority that's vested in the NCA comes from university presidents and from athletic directors and the people who hold representative positions inside the NCA. It is an incredibly democratic process. It is a painfully democratic process at times. It moves and fits and starts. It's unwieldy. It's complicated. It is, in the words of Winston Churchill, the worst form of government except for every other one. And, and that is the situation that we often find ourselves in now. When we see a problem or a challenge that needs to be reformed or changed or amended, then we go back and go through, much like at the United Nations, we go back through a very complex process to get all of the members to agree. If you want to change the rules as we did a year ago for men's basketball recruiting to allow Coach Romar to actually tweet a, tweet a kid or text a kid rather than call him on his phone, which was and remains for all the other coaches, one of the rules. So um, we, we have to... I have to pause because the absurdity of some of this is uh, unavoidable. So on the far left is a coach that's allowed to text student athletes. On his immediate right is a coach that's not allowed to text student athletes. All of those were rules that were put in place not by the NCAA staff but by the NCAA members. We sat down with all of the basketball coaches two years ago, I guess, coach, and we started talking about gee, what are the things that don't really make sense? Well, you know, when you tell a youngster today that you have to call them rather than text them, they first of all don't believe you're a human being anymore. <laughs> right? They, they text. That's what they do. But we have rules that are five, six, seven years old that said, no, no, you can't text because the kid has to pay the bill, and that was true seven or eight years ago. It's not today, but the rule hasn't changed. So working with the basketball coaches, we developed rules that we said, okay, what kind of proposals would you like? Ran it by all the university presidents, and lo and behold, Coach Romar can now send a text message. We then thought, we being the board of presidents and a group of people, thought, well, this is a great idea. Let's apply it to everyone. So lo and behold, they passed a rule that changed it for everyone, and then a bunch of coaches said, no, 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 we don't want a text. You can debate why. But... But nonetheless, the, the rules themselves are a product of that process and the individuals that, that are governed, not by an individual um, set of staff members. It is a very democratic process. It is a very complex process, and therefore it becomes unwieldy. But it is the only sensible way for this to occur. Those people who suggest that, um, that there ought to be a commissioner of college sports have never met a university president in their life. I assure you, I sh I'm sorry, Mike, I shouldn't speak for you. I have never met a university president that will happily say, yes, you, sir, take authority, all the authority for everything that goes on in college sports away from me and you run it the way you would like to run it and please don't ever ask my opinion. Uh, that is not 
the way universities in America operate. They are, again, highly democratic places that have responsibility for and authority over what goes on on their campuses. This is not the NBA that's in the business of making money. This is an organization that's responsible for running collegiate athletics for student athletes. So, as Pat also said, the NCAA is a very complex enterprise just in its scale. There are now nearly a half a million young men and women who play college sports under the banner of the NCAA. There's other, other options available also, but the NCAA is the dominant one by far. They play in three different divisions. They play under different sets of rules inside those divisions, but they're all NCAA athletes. When most people talk about college sports today, they're really only largely talking about Division I FBS or even BCS football, football played at the, at the most popular level, and men's basketball. And that's it. They're not talking about softball, which is a shame because they ought to. It ought to be every bit as popular as basketball, and they ought to be the third highest paid public official in the state, <laughs> and the coaches, right? You get that right? Okay. No. <clears throat> but, but predominantly, they're looking at you know, what you see on TV, men's basketball, men's football, and football, and men's basketball in Division I. That constitutes three and one half percent of the students who play college sports. Three and a half percent. People look at that three and a half percent and say, well, that's college sports. It is a part of college sports, an important part of college sports, but it is 96, they're missing 96 and a half percent of what goes on that we oversee and govern. The, the NCAA, through this very complicated process, has from that very beginning tried to pay attention to and keep the focus on, as, as both Pat and Mike said, on the educational experience of student athletes and their wellness and health and safety. Because sports in the past, and continuing today, obviously, we have injuries, but in the past, they were not regulated, they were not controlled, and the injury rates were astronomical and have continued to get dramatically better as time has moved on. Uh, and, and the NCAA has been the leader in sports safety from really the very beginning. It's quite a remarkable record. What we've been doing, and, and Pat wanted me to talk about also most recently, is also making sure that the student athletes who participate in sports have an academic experience that they're proud of and that, and that provides them with the opportunities that all of us had when we went to school and that they get to enjoy the benefit of that. The other bit of mythology about, well, first of all, schools make a lot of money. As Pat pointed out, 25 out of 1,100 had positive cash flow last year. That, so this mythology about them making money is silly. The other mythology that drives me crazy is that student athletes are bad students. So here's a fact that everyone needs to be aware of. At virtually every university in America, student athletes have higher graduation rates than the non-athletes. At virtually every university in America, student athletes have higher graduation than the rates than non-athletes. And that's true whether they're women students or men students. The women student athletes do a lot better. Uh, a lot better. But it's true whether they're men or women. It's true regardless of their race. And it's nearly consistently true across all sports. But in men's basketball and in football and in baseball, we've had graduation rates that aren't as high a level as the Committee on Academic Performance, a group of presidents and others who oversee this want them to be. Well, what target would they like? Well, the target that was established more than a decade ago was an 80% graduation rate. Now, for those of you in higher education that know graduation rates, an 80% target is a very high target. This is a non-trivial target. And the NCAA in Division I is hitting that target across every sport except for those three right now. And those three are closing in very, very fast on that 80% target. So in, with the problem children in basketball, Lorenzo, the problem children in basketball still have a graduation rate that's now almost 70%. And it's risen sharply over the past handful of years across the country in men's Division I basketball. We just put in place in October of this last year, and we'll be rolling them out as, as these, this, these next few years go on, we've rolled out new initial eligibility requirements that require a 2.3 grade point average in core courses in high school, not you know, not non-core courses, but a college prep curriculum, and in a sequence that requires you to take those courses over a regular high school career rather than having summer miracles this, the junior year before senior year. Um, and, and we just added a new set of requirements for all coaches, that, and these apply to all sports and all coaches, that if you're not on track to graduate, at least half of your kids on your team 
you will not be eligible for postseason play. So next year, if either of these coaches have complete undefe completely undefeated seasons, but they don't have their student athletes on track to graduate at least half of those kids, they will not be in postseason play. Nobody's going to the Rose Bowl with bad grades anymore. Nobody's going to uh, the, the Final Four if they don't have a 50, if they're not on track for a 50% graduation rate. No one's going to the Softball World Series unless they have also qualified in the classroom. This year for the men's basketball tournament, there are a dozen schools that it didn't matter what their records were on the court. They didn't qualify in the classroom. The impact of that change in rules is, I'll let the coaches speak for themselves, but is pretty profound. When you know that if your teammate isn't going to class, you will not get to go to the Final Four, there's a little peer pressure that's going to be applied there. If you know that this youngster that's, that's, that you're recruiting right now is not going to make it academically, then you know that you're not going to be in a tournament in a few years if you bring that person in. It's changed in the dynamic of success because the last statistic of the night, if we look just at men's basketball, there are 5,500 young men playing Division I men's basketball right now, 5,500. Of them, 60, 60 out of 5,500 go in the NBA draft. We don't write rules for the 60. We're not worried about those 60. They're going to be fine. We write the rules for the 5,500 for the ones who are not going to be playing in the NBA, for the ones who are going to be teachers and lawyers and doctors and moms and dads and do everything that everybody else does in society, that's who those rules are for and that's what we work very hard on at, at the NCAA. Right, thank you. Sure. One of the reasons we put together the panel tonight is that all four members have attended the University of Washington, are our graduates of the University of Washington. And I thought it was extraordinary because we were partners with the Alumni Association on this to actually be able to pull together this combination of people who are loyal representatives of the school and also involved directly and deeply in intercollegiate athletics. Ed Taylor got his PhD from the University of Washington and he is the Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Academic Affairs. He oversees the programs that are designed to support and ensure that all undergraduates are guaranteed a level of support and achievement here. He is also the person to whom the Academic Support Unit directly reports now that supports athletics. He himself has been a successful student athlete. He has been well, he went to Gonzaga. Come on. <laughs> last, uh, time I checked, last time I checked, we were number one in the country. <laughs> that was a month ago or so. Whoa. <laughs> oh. I God. had no idea. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> when Ed, no, I won't go there, Ed. Um, <laughs> I, actually, I will. When Ed was an undergraduate, uh, when Ed was a high school player, he was such a fine player. He was known as a legend of Lompoc. So I would like to welcome the legend of Lompoc <laughs> to talk about oh, how to he views this enterprise as an educational enterprise because our claim is it belongs in the university because it is about educating human beings and Ed is the one who is responsible for attending to that dimension of it. Ed? Working closely with, with um, many of my colleagues who are, who are here. And as, as compelling as, as all of this is, really at, at, a, at a macro level, um, and as compelling as it is at the university level, and even, even the, the NCAA as, a, as an organization such as, as it is, um, and as compelling as it is th that, that we're the only country that actually embeds big time athletics in its, in its universities, as compelling as, as that is in and of itself, and the tensions that, that come with that. Um, the part of, of my role that I, that I actually find most interesting and that really frames all of this, in my mind, all of this as, as, a, as a moral en endeavor is myself and, and my colleagues. We get to meet some of these uh, student athletes and their parents. And, and we're moving further and further into high schools. I'll let you two talk about, about this. But it's, it's a remarkable thing to meet 17-year-olds that are coming to visit, 16-year-olds that are trying to imagine themselves here. 15-year-olds 
met a 14-year-old recruit for the first time. Um, talk about a short conversation. Talk about um, <laughs> choosing majors for the 14-year-old. <laughs> so we're done now. <laughs> and, and, then you, and then you see these parents um, who, who come along with their, with their kids. And I'm using the word kids in, intentionally because we're talking in some cases 15 and, and 16-year-olds. Um, and to look at some of these parents from who, who have come here, and some of them have taken their first flight and, and they land here from, from Southeast LA or um, Santa Ynez, California, um, from Bremerton, from the Skagit Valley. And, and they, make here, they make their way here on, on a visit. And they want to have a conversation with us uh, about whether or not we can educate their, their sons and daughters. And, and the gravity of that conversation, I think, in so many ways outstrips all of the other things that, that we, we talk about and that we worry about. Because it, it really comes down to, I think, a, a fundamental question for me. Because you have to look these parents in the eye. You'd have to do this. And, and you have to look these kids in the eye. And you have to answer the question, can we live up, can we live up to the promise that we're about to make to them? Can, can we live up to the promise? And in some cases, if you're talking to a 15-year-old, we're talking years out. We're talking <laughs> about a relationship that may extend even beyond what the coaches are. So we have to answer the question, can we live up to the promises that we're about to make? And then at the end, there's some of us, faculty and, and my colleagues here, um, who have to see those parents and get to see those parents at graduation along, along the way. And then ask the question, have we lived up to the promise that we've, that we've made here? So, uh, so mine is in some ways a, a really wonderful role and it's a unique role because my job isn't to recruit these students or student athletes to the University of Washington. Um, it's to make sure that they're making good choices for, for their kids and making sure that wherever they go, that someone's living up to that commitment and promise. A, a little context for this, this idea of this notion of student athlete. Um, um, there's a piece by, by Taylor Branch in the, um, in the Atlantic that, that and one of the and he calls out a couple of things. Branch does. He calls out this notion of of, of the student athlete, um, in part because he's referring back to 1950, um, um, a man named Ray Dennison, a football player. Um, he he died playing football, and his wife filed a um, workers' compensation um, um, claim, and the university and ultimately the Colorado Supreme Supreme Court argued that that this man was not a an employee of the university. He was, in fact, a, st a student, but not a student like other students. He was, a, he was a student athlete. And so the whole concept of student athlete was actually coined to defend the university against liability claims. Um, and that was in the 1950s. Jump ahead 20 years to 1970 at this university. And I think what uh, is akin to a revolution happened here. And it may seem small, but a woman named Gertrude Peoples started what we now know to be student athlete academic services. And, and Gertrude um, um, is a bit of a role model for, for me and for many student athletes here, but she, she started the revolution. Um, and in her place now, and so Gertrude started during a time of racial strife and, and difficulty here, and Gertrude started mentoring and supporting um, student athletes. 30, 40 years later, what we've got in place is a, is a marvelous director of student athlete academic services that I talk to pretty regularly. We've got um, over 90 part-time tutors. We've got um, three full-time, um, um, what do we call them? Uh, um, um, learning specialists, thank you, Kim. Learn, learning specialists at the front end of this report. In some ways, Mark, when you cite the graduation rate, so we've got an 81% graduation rate for all of our student athletes on, on this campus. Second in the Pac-10. Second in the Pac-10. We've got 74% for, for football. We've got 78% for men's basketball. We've got 92% for women's basketball. We've got a, a women's soccer team where a number of those kids are in our honors program and they graduate and they're some of the best um, students in our university. Um, these are students to be proud of and in some ways we provide the kind of support that I'd want for all of our students because I think if we had that kind of support for all of our students, I think we'd see graduation rates that look much like that. And so in some ways, I think the things that we do for student athletes are perhaps the envy for, for many of our general students. Mm -hmm. I think my time is up, but there's a lot more to talk about. Heather Tarr is a graduate of the University of Washington. She played uh, on our softball team. She was a walk-on, earned her spot on the team, left, the pro graduated from the program, and then was an assistant coach at Pacific, where she became an associate head coach, and then came back at an extraordinarily young age and wowed the uh, selection committee and was chosen 
to be the coach of the softball team. She's one of those coaches whose students graduate at astronomically high rates, and they, they, they learn the art of living as a human being in her teams, as well as the art of playing. And she has won a national championship, and she has been coach of the year, and I think she has exemplified, at least to me, many of the things we want when we think of coaches as teachers. Heather's going to be addressing the issue of one of the great unsung accomplishments, I believe, of the NCAA in college sports, the role of Title IX and what it has meant for the role of women and the status of women, and how she thinks about those issues when she, in fact, is dealing with and recruiting and working with her own students. Well, first of all, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here to speak on behalf, I think, of the female side of the athletic experience. Um, every single thing that I do as a coach comes from my experience as a student athlete, and I had such a great experience here being a part of the student athlete academic services and the support system that surrounds the student athlete. And now my goal coming back here was not only to win a national championship and bring our first one home, but was to give our student athletes within the softball program an opportunity that's better than even what I had. Um, of course, now we've won the national championship, so we checked that one off the list. We're still trying to get some more of those. But just be able to immerse our student athletes and our women into the culture of the University of Washington, into the Pacific Northwest. And I think Title IX, since 1970s, it's been a wonderful thing for athletes. Of course, I benefited from that law, but I think now even more the economics are getting involved and money is being made and coaches even at, at my level are getting paid probably, I hate to say this because our administrators are in here, but way too much for what we do just because it's such a great thing to be able to empower 18 to 22 year old women to be great at every single thing that they do in a great place like this. But um, just going back to the, the opportunity that I get to give them an experience to be great, um, but to keep in perspective that it, it's just a game that we play and they have to thrive in this university community. That's very challenging. We're recruiting against Stanford all the time because I want this, the 1800 SAT score student just like Stanford does and now that Stanford's kind of lowered some of their admissions standards. They probably say they, they haven't, but I know they have because we can't <laughs> get some that we used to get. Uh, but anyways, I, I just really believe fundamentally that it's my, it's my role as the, the head coach at a university like this to find student athletes that can fit here, that can thrive here. And unfortunately, and fortunately, I guess, I coach a sport where you can't overthink it. As a hitter, if you think too much, sometimes it hurts your ability to hit. So. You kind of don't want the smart ones to have the bat in their hand. You want the smart ones to have the ball and go like this. Um, and <laughs> so just trying to find the, the right people. And, and now even more, we're I'm, I actually have a team of recruits from freshmen in high school to seniors in high school. We have probably 14 verbal commitments that are coming here, so we've recruited young women that don't have their licenses and they don't even have a high school GPA yet and we're banking on their pedigree of their families to to come here and of course we're relying on Kim Durand and Ed Taylor and even coach Romar to help us sell that this is a place that their their young child could come and thrive so just keeping in perspective we don't have we have a pro league that has four teams in it as a softball body um, we don't have the Olympics yet or any more for softball so we are the highest level typically that our women will come and compete at but just keeping in perspective what this thing is all about and I'm glad that we don't have to worry about our juniors being drafted and wanting to leave um, it's it's not about that it's about them should I be a biology major or do can I do I have to change it to medical anthropology um, so it's it's a great opportunity to stay at the core of what this university is all about, what academics are about, and what athletics are about. And I would just finish by saying the, the best thing about empowering the young women in our program is that when they're done here in four years, I bet every single person in this room is going to want to hire the female student athlete that comes from 
our programs, not just the softball program, but all of ours. So, and that speaks to the strength of all the support that we have and the great university we have to sell. Thank you. Lorenzo Romar is the Dean of Coaches in the PAC 8, 10, 12. Uh, <laughs> we can go back a long way on that one. And I, Lorenzo is on this panel because to me, when I was working with him, he exemplifies, I think, something that's extraordinarily important to what a good teacher is, and that is a good teacher connects to their students, and because of that connection, they are demanding and they are caring, and in that relationship, the student becomes a better human being. And I think that that's critical to the enterprise that he sets up. It's also helpful that they also are superb basketball players who win on a regular basis and win Pac-10 championships, and Lorenzo has been Coach of the Year in the conference twice, I believe. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. And, then we can and he will be addressing the issue of the recruiting process, as both Ed and Heather pointed out, has gotten, in its own qu quiet way, quite insane when you are offering scholarships to 14-year-olds. And at the same time, you are going down to the wire trying to convince someone to come to your school rather than to go to other schools that would guarantee them competitiveness in the national championship arena. And I think what Lorenzo has is a very specific philosophy of what he looks for and how he judges. And that's what he's going to be addressing, is that how, what do you look for when you were recruiting, especially in an area where he is, where a very high percentage of his students are coming from academically underprepared backgrounds. So it poses unique challenges for them when they enter the university to be both athletes and students. Well, when we look at a young person's academic profile, if it's at a high level, we need not be really concerned that they're going to be able to uh, handle a college workload and ultimately get their degree. The ones that have lower GPAs, lower test scores, that would be either marginal students or at-risk students, those are the ones that we really have to take a good hard look at and see if they can uh, be successful at this level. Well, the first thing I want to know is uh, why. You talk to a young person on the phone, you, you get a a read as to what type of person that is, uh, introverted, extroverted, and I will ask them the question if they haven't done as well as they maybe should have in the classroom, I'll say, explain that one to them. Why is this the case? You obviously could be doing a lot better. Why is this, this the case? And their answer is usually pretty revealing. And you run into all types of answers. Uh, some uh, will just flat out tell you, I hate school. They'll just tell you, you know, I, I don't like school. Okay, let's, let's, <laughs> let's go on to the next one. Uh, There's some that just uh, haven't had the, the proper fundamentals to do any better at that point in, as to where they are. There are others that were just negligent. They're no problem doing the work. They've just either put their sport or many other distractions ahead of their academics. And then there are others whom have learning disabilities. And when they're on that basketball floor in our sport, they're looked at as flawless, as perfect, a hero, a star. And they like that. But in the classroom, they can't quite get it because of some block up here. And they're embarrassed of it, and they don't want to admit it. They don't want anyone else to know it. So maybe they sit in the back of the class, or maybe they don't come to class, not because they just don't want to come, but because they can't bear let anyone see them in this less than stellar, uh, less than uh, super position. We try to find out who's what and where they are. Once you're able to find that out, then I have to really look at what is their attitude about it and what are they willing to do about it. If their attitude is right, 
and they realize, hey, I've been negligent. I've allowed distractions to get in the way, but I want to turn this around. Great. The hardest thing to do is to get them to admit that maybe they have a learning disability. And after we develop a relationship, sometimes we're able to get to the bottom of that and figure out, so that's why. That's the issue. And I've been able to talk to some young people and explain to them that there are millionaires that have learning disabilities. I tell them, I guarantee you, I've never been checked, but I think I have a few learning disabilities. <laughs> and we talk about it. Uh, Magic Johnson ha uh, was dyslexic, you know, and he's been very successful off the basketball floor. Obviously, on the basketball floor, he was successful. Try to help them to understand that they can be successful. If their attitude is right, regardless of where they are academically, I mean, I don't care where they are academically, they have a chance to be successful in the right environment. And that is our job to find out where they are and put them in a position to where they can be successful once they get to that level. The ones that make excuses and place the blame on everyone else and are con men, so to speak, those are the ones that we decide not to go after. This one is not going to make it. They're trying to pull the wool over someone's eyes and they're never going to improve. That's a decision that we have to make. Yes, sir, thank you. Those of you who have written down questions, if you'd like to, could you please send them to the aisles and we'll be collecting and someone will be going through those and at some point handing them up to us. Um, I would like to thank you all for the level of candor that you brought and I want to pursue uh, uh, some of the issues a little deeper. And the first one I want to start with is that the premise of this panel is not just that students are students in the classroom, but that students are students in sport, and that they're learning something, that there's something that happens working with coaches and being a member of a team. And Heather, you were very direct, I think, about this. And what I'd like to ask is, what in fact are students learning in athletics? What do they leave having played college athletics? What have they learned? How have they changed as people? Um, how can we defend this or not defend this as a really a form and extension of education? And I'd really like to start with our coaches, and then Ed, you have been a player, and Mark, if you want to add, but. Well, I'll chime in first. Um, first of all, they, they understand, especially in the world that we live in today, how to work as a team, because then we're not gonna succeed as a group in the end, when we want to succeed at the end of our season, if we don't have teamwork, if we don't have trust, if we don't have shared values. And from the minute we recruit somebody, we have to figure out if they're the type of person that can do a lot of those things. So the fact that they get to work as a team, a teammate within our environment, and then they can go work as the individual student and do whatever they want to do up here, but they're a better teammate they understand preparation, that you're just not gonna roll out on the, on the court or the field and succeed without preparation. And they have to understand, I, I think, beyond everything, how to trust. Whether it's trusting the people that are helping them, trusting their teammate, trusting their coaches, and that's something that's it's hard to earn. But when you learn how to do that, it perpetuates itself, just as self, selflessness does and understanding preparation. Lorenzo? To, to add to that, I'd say uh, athletes, if you're going to reach a certain level, you have to really learn how to compete. And some never do, I guess. But there are a lot that do. You're kind of forced in the environment in competitive sports to learn how to be relentless, how to persevere, how not to just quit. You, have, you develop an incredible drive. Before you even get out on that playing field or court uh, many times, there's a drive 
that has to take place to get you out there or to get you to that level, or you never get there. You develop that habit, that standard way of pushing yourself. Uh, you learn to do things where there's just no other way to do it because you don't, you don't want to fail. I talk to many athletes, some are motivated by different things, but some are motivated by fear of failure. It just continues to drive them. Some are motivated because they want to be the best. But uh, in sports, if that's backed by an education, that is transferable. And that could go on into the work, the workforce. Ed, I, I learned something pretty, pretty, um, I think, profound my my um, freshman year at Gonzaga. I wasn't supposed to talk about Gonzaga, but you you brought that you brought that up. You brought you brought it up. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have. Um, and the the thing that I that I um, it's actually pretty humbling to to say this, but but the thing that I that I learned. Um, coming from a small rural public high school um, to a liberal arts Jesuit university in, Spok in Spokane. Um, that as, as I sat in, in a classroom with the students reading <laughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer's letters and pa papers from prison, um, and I was struggling with this and I realized that there were um, 17 kids in a class, 16 of them had been prepared for this experience. Um, Many of them had been to prep schools, and they'd been prepared. They had been prepared for, for this, and and I had not. And it and it struck me the difference between the kinds of schools and the ways in which people get access to um, to higher education. And part of it, I, I made it part of my business as I as I went through. Um, it was an important realization for me that this was not just about in, intelligence. It wasn't these kids were smarter than than I was. They'd been prepared dif differently. And and when I see student athletes now come to us. Who, who come from different kinds of high schools, from different communities, I understand that this is not just about who's smart and who is not smart. It's about access, it's about providing different points of access, different ways in which we can get access to, 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 to higher education in this country. Um, I learned that it took an awful lot of work uh, to, to be successful in this, but, but I learned looking back that at least it, it, it would be my job, ultimately, um, to try and close that gap between how people are prepared for, for this work. And I think that's the work that we do now at this university, is try and close the gap between those who are prepared in certain kinds of ways and those who were underprepared for this university, knowing at the end of the day that we're producing citizens that we're gonna be very proud of at the end. You know, I, if I could add one, one interesting thing that's occurred since I uh, took on this relatively new role that was utterly unexpected, Pat, it was that, uh, I've been contacted by education leaders, ministries of education from all around the world, <clears throat> Asia, Latin America, Europe, about their developing a deeper understanding of the American athletic experience. And, and the point when I sit and chat with them a little bit is they, they say, look, you know, we're, we're good at educating people about science or math or engineering or whatever the, the traditional academic skill set is. But when we compare our students, our graduates, to American graduates, yours seem to be much better in leadership, in teamwork, in initiative, in um, resilience, in risk taking. And one of their conclusions, and I don't, know, I don't know if there's empirical evidence to support this or not, but one of their conclusions is, you Americans play a lot of sport, <laughs> right? And, and you've combined it with education. And, and we in China or Mexico or Korea, or all these places of contact, you, we, we want to know if we can learn from that. And maybe we need to incorporate that into our education. So they're not thinking about sport as entertainment. They're thinking about it as pedagogy, as, as a way to teach skills that they don't teach very well in, in, from their point of view. And, and so it's, you know, when we think about our, our, our youth, whether we ever made it to be where we were good enough to play it for, for these coaches, we all learned playing, you know, bunch ball soccer that, you, you know, you got a position to play and you got to trust somebody behind you and you don't, you know, and if you don't, you win or lose as a team and we, you know, from, from grade school on up, most all of us played some organized sports and so we, we ingrained those lessons into 
into our young people at a pretty early age in, in a variety of ways, even if it's just t-ball. You know, they're learning that this is a sport and I've got a job to do and I've got to count on other people. And, and you know, when, when I do my job and she does her job, we're going to be successful. There are some things that are, that's very hard to train in a, and, and educate in a classroom setting. And, and so it's been fascinating to me. I didn't anticipate that I'd be contacted by educators from around the world about how do we emulate the NCAA? And my first thought is, what are you, nuts? <laughs> and, 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 then, and then you sit back and you think, well, isn't this intellectually interesting, right? Yeah. That, that they yeah. see this as a competitive advantage for the American society. That's, that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have guessed? I want to pick up on something Ed said. And extended. I think amongst the faculty and, and there's a, a kind of ongoing level, some lot of indifference, some people committed, some people defiantly hostile to intercollegiate athletics and most of those folks are concerned about one particular issue and that is that issue that oftentimes the, the major revenue sports are dominated very often by minority students. And a large number of those minority students are coming from social economic backgrounds where they have not been as well prepared uh, and would have the experience that Ed had. And w their concern was twofold. One, very often they come in under what we'll call special admissions programs. They w the, the criteria, the numbers they present, and the, for the formal presentation of numbers is not identical to the standard average that the university would have. So they come in under a special admissions program and it takes a level of significant investment to guarantee that they actually have a chance to get an education. If they don't, we end up like the University of Cincinnati, which for years was an extremely successful basketball team and graduated one black player in 10 years. And that's where a lot of the critics look at us and our enterprise and see it as exploitation. And it, it, that can only be answered if we can address this issue of why, why create this special category of admission, how do we defend that, and how do we guarantee that we're not exploiting them, that we're actually getting them real educations. Heather? <laughs> It, it's, it's important to note that it's not just for student athletes, right? We, 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 um, we have a category for admitting students with, with special talents, and, and we actually do admit the students who, who really do bring something special because in part we, we admit to, to the whole. We, we want an interesting and diverse, um, multiracial, democratic community. Students learn from each other when they're different from one another. And, and so you'll find talented students on this campus who, not all of whom reach the same academic, academic level. You'll find jazz musicians, you'll find dancers, you'll find student athletes as, as well. I think the, the important part of this, um, Pat, is, and, and I can't speak for Miami and I can't speak for Cincinnati, I can speak for the University of Washington. Um, in many ways, that, that decision around admitting um, um, special admit student athletes, it, it becomes a faculty decision. I, I sit at the table with, with many of my colleagues, Pete Dukes and, and, and Bob Stacy, who's, who's uh, Bob's a historian. We're all here and we're not, we're not necessarily here as fans. We're here and what faculty do is we deliberate and we sit at the table and we ask ourselves with each and every one of these student athletes, are we a better university for having them here? And, and can we educate them well and can we do it with integrity? And we do it case by case by case and we sit in rooms and Ronson knows this and, and we ask, do we have a chance of educating? Can we live up to the promise that we're making to them? And can they live up to the promise um, that they're making to, to us? And we make those decisions with, with great care. So we're in regular conversation with each other, faculty, administrators, um, our student athlete services um, colleagues. We're all in very regular conversation in, in our own governance structure in, in a way that I think really does have integrity. And I think our graduation rates show it. I think the quality of student athletes that we that we graduate, many of them who end up in this community that we're accountable to. And what I really appreciate is that we've got coaches, and, and you said it, Pat, at the, at the, at the end of the day, if, if we don't have coaches who are educators, and I think some of the finest educators that we've got on this campus are, 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 are coaches, and, and I, I'd say this if they weren't here. If, if they're not educators, then we've made a mistake. We've made a mistake up, up front. Um, 
So we have to trust who we hire. We have to hire people with, with high levels of integrity. And we have to see these student athletes all the way through the system. Um, and then for many of us, we see these young men and women 10 years afterwards, and we ask ourselves, did we do, our, did we do right by, by these kids? So I can speak to what we're doing at this university. Are we there yet? Not, not quite. We have a ways to go. Um, but, but I certainly feel like I'm accountable, and I think we're very public about the work that we do. This is no longer sort of a private practice that goes on in, in this university. I have to though, I know you didn't ask me this question, I don't want to dominate, but, but I think You're the, the president. <laughs> I think the, the real um, risk, and it's not more than a risk, it's a crime that goes on uh, around sport is the, this complete confusion about using sport to achieve ends and sport using you. And, and, and it happens, I think, and I'd love to hear the coaches comment on this. When, when young people are, are convinced that their best hopes of success in life are through professional athletics, you, you see very different outcomes, at least I do, Heather, with softball than with men's basketball because they know that the pinnacle of their career is to come play for you. They're, they're not they're not saying, you know, the, 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 if only I can get to Washington, then I can go play in the league, right? So no, I'm, I'm going to Washington, and, and, that's gonna, and I'm going to win a championship. We've got way too many people. Coach, you and I have chatted a little bit about this. We've got way too many young men, because these are predominantly young men, who believe that the single best opportunity for them in life, maybe the only opportunity for them in life, is to get to Washington and get to the NBA. That's it. And the statistics are so staggeringly um, uh, in opposition to that, that dream that they have in mind that we, we do a, a huge disservice as a society by dangling in front of them the, the, as, as hope, you know, the idea that they're going to play in the NBA. I, get, I said earlier, you know, there's 5,500 of them in Division I and 60 will go to the NBA in any one year. We surveyed our Division II students, student athletes in basketball. So these are Division II schools are Central Washington and, and Western Washington. 50% of the NCAA Division II men's basketball players said, yes, I'm going to play professional basketball. 50%. None. Not one. I don't think, Coach, you played in the league a little bit. I don't think one from Division II school is ever going to play in, in the league. And, and so we need to find ways of, of not popping their dreams, but of getting them to say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play ball and I'm going to play for Coach Robar, and man, yeah, maybe I'm, maybe I'm that tiny, tiny fraction that's going to play in the league, but, but mostly I'm going to get an education and I'm going to go to a Final Four with Coach Romar. Won't that be the pinnacle of my life. And, and, and we've, we've pumped up way too many kids right now to think that the entertainment industry, whether it's, you know, I'm going to be a rock star, or I'm going to be a, a, a professional athlete, is the way to pursue your dreams. And I think it, it's especially pervasive in the minority community, but it's, it's everywhere. You ask a seven-year-old today, what do you want to be when you grow up? They don't say a fireman anymore. They say, I, I want to I play in the NBA. I want to be a rock star. I say, really? And, and we... I think, I think that's a huge issue for us as a society, and we need to confront it. Lorenzo? When I say this, you have to understand that uh, I was raised in a home with, with both parents. The entire time we were raised, two parents were at home. And as I'm going through this, I want you to imagine if that weren't the case, if someone else raised me that wasn't around a lot. Both of my parents worked for as long as I can remember. But understand the most educated person in our house was my mother, who dropped out of the 11th grade. My father dropped out of the 6th grade. My grandfather dropped out, as he said, being from the South, the third grade. <laughs> the third grade. When I came to the University of Washington on an athletic scholarship, he continued to ask me in the summers, do you still have that good job up there? <laughs> he had no concept of what this was about here at the University of Washington. 
When I graduated from high school, that was a proud, proud day for my mother and my parents. High school, that was, my son did better than I did. She was fired up. This college thing, that, we don't do that in this family because no one does that. We don't know how to do that. How do you get there? Who has the money for all that stuff, let alone a career? I knew nothing about a career. Very fortunate to be able to excel somewhat in the game of basketball that allowed me to get to college through that game. And then I was kind of tricked into seeing that there were some other things going on in life. <laughs> and as I said at the outset, I had two parents in the home that worked. There are many kids out there that don't have that. We're not being groomed to go to college to take over the family business. I wasn't. A lot of those kids aren't. A lot of these kids that come in. So when we get an at-risk student who was brought up in a very poor environment, who was not held accountable, and now they have an opportunity to come to college and literally, literally be whatever they want to be in life, and they don't like school, they don't see the value of school based on what they've been taught, then they take a class and they see their classmates, other students around them, and then they see that there was this, this, this major that they didn't know existed that maybe they could do, and now they have a little interest, and before you know it, they've taken a liking to school. When they finally come to the realization that they are one of many that are not going to play professionally, they're already here. They're already here. Many don't understand the value of that degree that they obtain until it's 10 years later. And instead of starting, having to start over with four kids and just being, so, it's so overwhelming, they just say, forget it, they do have the degree. They got to start because they were able to have an opportunity to gain an education. And I think a lot of times people get it twisted and they want to call them the dumb jocks, when they're getting an opportunity, their ability to get an opportunity uh, can kind of erase that label even in their own mind. Some of them consider themselves a dumb jock because they don't know anything else. College provides another way out. I'm going to ask a question that's actually putting together two that came from our audience. And it's really about the kind of emergence of what the NCAA is actually doing and becoming and the emergence of kind of inequality within and among colleges. That you really are, are moving into a world where there's a select group of universities, largely in the elite conferences because of their TV contracts, and that are investing heavily, and they're part of an arms race. Uh, and it's an arms race that no one seems able to stop. The NCAA, by the way, once tried to stop the arms race by putting a cap on coaches' salaries, and it lost a multi-million dollar, actually 45, mi that. $45 million dollar lawsuit for restraint of trade. Yeah. So there is no capacity to regulate those kinds of things. So what do you see happening? Uh, you know, we are, the University of Washington is on the cusp of being with the has, but the, that break is becoming increasingly, so much so that, for instance, an act of simple justice, paying student athletes full cost of attendance rather than what we now pay them now, which does not cover the full cost of attendance, is passed by the presidents and then voted down by the NCAA when the have-not schools. The membership. The membership. Yeah. The, what do you see happening with that? I mean, is it going to break apart? Do we need a separate division for the elite football schools? Yeah, so, so the, the economics of, of um, college sport on a campus-by-campus -campus basis are um, being increasingly aggravated by the success of a handful, because it's literally a handful of media contracts. There's, there's essentially five major conferences now that have very large uh, local media contracts, the Pac-12 being one of those, 
and, and that's being driven ex almost expressly by football. And, and so you've now got inside Division I, all the teams that these guys have to compete against, a, a variation of the size of, of um, athletic budgets that runs from about $5 million a year, in some cases less than $5 million a year, for the whole athletic budget to $155 million a year. So huge, huge variability. And one of our challenges in decision making is that all of those people get to vote on all of those rules, right? So you've got to find compromises that the, the school with a $5 million budget can live with and the one that 155 can live with. And that's, uh, the, the, it is true that only in college sports, the only thing in higher education, do the University of Texas and Texas Southern have much in common. And that is that they are both Division I schools. One has a $150 million budget, one has a $5 million budget, but yet when we, when we put in place, as, as Pat mentioned, a, a proposal, the president's passed a proposal to allow, not mandate, but simply to allow universities to provide up to an additional $2,000 in support, a financial support for student athletes that tries to close the full cost of attendance, not paying them to play, but covers the real cost of being a student. Uh, that was passed unanimously by the board, but but voted down, as you just heard, by the members because a lot of member schools simply don't have that money. They don't have that money. Uh, and, and some have resources that could pay for it and some don't. Inside the Pac-12 itself, there's huge variation. The amount of money that schools have to take from their operating budgets, from their academic budgets to support their athletic program, not the other way around. Washington's lucky in that it, it doesn't have to do those sorts of things, but many do. So. Uh, we're in the middle right now, we being the, the presidents that run the association, are in the middle right now of a debate, a, an active debate on that. We're talking about it May 2nd. We'll talk about it again at our August meeting. Do we need to find a, a, a new subdivision inside Division I? Do we need a fourth division? Do we, how, do we, how do we create greater homogeneity among the members so that they can govern themselves effectively? It, it's it's um, inside baseball in the extreme, but it's one of the most important issues facing college yeah. athletics <clears throat> right now, and, and we're going to have to work our way through it because it, the, the model just doesn't work anymore if you, if you keep it the way it is. I want to thank the members of the audience for that, those two questions. I hope it did justice to what you were doing. We are coming down on the end, and I wanted to end with just one simple question, and that would be to each of you, if there were one reform that you could make, that you would like to see happen that would help the student athlete get an education and survive and thrive better, what would it be? And Lorenzo, I'm going to start with you. I'm not going to put Heather on the line this time. It's going first. Yeah. I'm going to defer to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> What if I just don't say anything? <laughs> well, you can pass. Pardon? I've, I've never seen you pass, but feel free to pass. <laughs> <laughs> never been one to give in to peer pressure. I'm going to pass. Oh, okay. <laughs> Heather? I would just say from a recruiting standpoint, there's just no regulation. I mean, we're asked, we are trying to compete to recruit ninth graders, but we can't talk to them. The only way we can talk to them is if they come to our campus, so it's difficult to try to weed out the who fits and who doesn't fit, who can afford to come visit on their own dollar, those things. It's, it's difficult and it's creating an interesting thing that who knows what it will turn out to be in five years. Ed? I don't know how to manage the, the, the money part of this, and, and, I, and I worry about, about that. I worry about um, the, the kind of revenue that's shifting all the way through this. I think, Pat, part of what you were asking is do we pay student athletes? And in, in some ways, when you think about the, the, the kind of resources and services that we provide for student athletes, we're, you know, by the time they're finished, four or five years here, we invest about three quarters of a million dollars in each student <coughs> athlete by the time their five years is, is done. When you think about tutorial services, when you think about training, coaching, all of the kinds of support. So, so I'm reluctant around, around payment of student athletes. And, and, but somehow the, the, the amount of revenue and, and that big time just needs to be, to be managed. I'm not sure what policy issues need um, 
to be addressed there, but I do worry about that, and I think we need to continue to be public. Um, I think we can need to continue to support um, the well-being of student athletes and keep our primary focus on them. And Mark, I'm still compelled by your your question about I think it was about ideation. How do we how do we create pathways and avenues for for um, for young people that may or may not be through athletics? Um, but I can I can tell you, and, I, and you two can probably speak to this. And I don't I know we don't have time, but one thing that I knew when I was 13, 14, and 15 was that when I went to this little outdoor basketball court, the, the hoop was always going to be 10 feet high. And the ball was on, always going to be 9 inches in diameter. And, and, and the hoop was always going to be 18 inches in diameter. No matter where I went, those rules were always basically the same, which I don't know was the case in any other aspect of society. Where everything else was ambiguous, that was not ambiguous. So I would love to remove some of the ambiguity and some of the life choices that, 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 that young people have so that there's a clear pathway and that there are a clear set of rules for how to get here. Because those rules don't change very, very much. Mark? <laughs> well, we've, we've been working on so many <coughs> reform efforts to address a lot of the things that have just been described here and, and uh, trying to get people to understand that, that coaches are a positive influence in the lives of young people and not a negative issue. And I, I, I want Heather to spend more time with young people, not less time, but uh, trying, to, trying to reach consensus around what those, those parameters are as a challenge. But if I could only, if I could wave a wand and only do one thing, and the association doesn't have the authority, the university doesn't have the authority, uh, no, no one has the, 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 the right to do this, uh, I, I would say that if you come to college as a student athlete, you're going to spend at least three years there. And uh, <laughs> you know, because for the simple reason that uh, Lorenzo's story is such a compelling story, that they may come to him thinking they're going to do a, be a one and done and go off to the NBA, but but if but if our coaches and I'm I'm biased because I I love these coaches I. Yeah, when an AD said he wanted to hire a 29-year-old softball coach, I thought he lost his mind. But, <laughs> but, it, but it worked out. It worked out. And, and I know, I know that, that if, if they have at least three years yeah. with the young man, Kim and all of her colleagues have <clears throat> some people for three years, regardless of what their motivation is, right, they may just by accident get an education. And, and it may be even contrary to their own, you know, desires. But the probability that they'll have a satisfying life just skyrockets. And, and so I don't know how we get there. Those aren't our rules. Those are other people's rules. But I'd, I'd sure love to get to that place. Thank you. Lorenzo. <laughs> I temporarily passed. There wasn't for the oh, I, didn't, I, I did not hear the temporary What's the part. <laughs> I'm coachable. If I have to shut up, I will. <laughs> Never. I would like to see stiffer restrictions on transfers. I think we're at an age, and it starts from little league, peewee league, whatever you want to call it, where parents, and I shouldn't say it that way like it's 100%, most parents are not holding their children accountable anymore. It's always someone else's fault. It's the coach's fault. It's the, they didn't pass you the ball. They didn't. It's always someone else's fault, and that continues to go up to each level. When it finally gets to our level, if they're not playing enough, if they're not getting enough shots, if they're not getting enough love, as they say, from the coaches, with the NBA thing looming right here, they're just quick to transfer. Let's just do it another way. What we're teaching as parents, our kids, are that there's always an excuse. How are you going to develop that way if it's always someone else's fault? That means you're okay. You don't have to get better. It's someone else's fault. And I'd like to see the rules be a little tougher when you just decide, I'm just going to quit because I didn't have my way. I think sports, as we were talking about earlier, there are many lessons that are taught, and I said one of the things you learn is how to persevere. Well, if you can just walk away because you're not doing your job and you can blame it on someone else, you're, you're not learning how to persevere. If there was 
more time left, I'd really tell you what was on my mind, but <laughs> there is. Well, on behalf of the Evans School and of Dean Sandra Archibald, I'd like to thank our panelists for participating this evening, President Emmert, Dean Taylor, Coach Tarr, Coach Romar, and thank you for not passing. Uh, we also appreciated working with the U of Dub Alumni Association as our partner in this, and I think it was the inspiration for this gathering of people who have been alums of the University of Washington. I'd also like to thank U of W TV for their work in terms of the webcast and in terms of the fact that they're going to televise this later. And I'd like to thank President Young for showing up and stealing part of my speech from me um, <laughs> and giving us a really great launch for this. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for caring, both our live audience and our web audience. And I hope this has been helpful in contributing to our understanding of this issue. Thank you all very much.